how we want to move. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Just gonna hit this. Uh, yeah, some some interesting new findings and how we're gonna kind of continue to push this project forward as as we get to the end at the end of this year. So uh, this work is funded by Norwegian Research Council, um, and and the the title is is uh, kind of all about the, the the interaction between pathogens and climate change and, and fish movement. This is a a seabird branch road in a river in Western Norway where I've been working for a few years. So it's 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 not all my own work. Uh, Nate Valsa is a research professor at Norse, so we've been working together on this for many years. Uh, Jan Davidson is a professor at NTNU in Norway, uh, and, and Sandra Elde is postdoc with, uh, with myself and Knud and, and Jan. Uh, Christy Miller is a research scientist at Department of Fisheries o and Oceans in uh, Nanaimo, BC, and they have a, a, a large program focused on uh, the, the Strategic Salmon Health Initiative, where they're, they're screening for pathogens and gene expression and trying to understand the the individual underlying factors uh, governing migration of Pacific salmon. And we're, we're, we brought her into this project to, to help with her expertise in genomics uh, on the, the Atlantic salmon and the, and the brown trip. Uh, Cecilia and Lata are PhD students with, uh, uh, with Norse and they've been working a lot on, on the tagging and the sampling and, and a lot of field work and helping out with analyses. So uh, this is part of the project team, uh, a few other uh, additional partners, but it's a large collaborative uh, four-year project. And myself, uh, I'm new to many people here. Uh, I, as, as Boris mentioned, I've been working in, in Norway on this Bergen Telemetry Network Initiative. Uh, a lot of my work focuses on animal, animal movement. Where are animals moving? Why are they going there? Uh, which individuals? So who is going where? Uh, and using these tools, which obviously interfaces quite quite well with the, with the tracking network where I'm uh, now located for the last few months and really excited to be back at DAL and integrated with the community. Going to be bringing on some new projects, looking for uh, undergraduate students in the honors program, hopefully hiring some master's students and, uh, and PhDs from marine biology in the coming years. So uh, great to be back and uh, great to be giving a seminar. So uh, disease is really a, a fascinating ecological interaction. Uh, it's something that I think is relatively underdeveloped in a lot of what we're doing, a lot of the questions that we're asking about animals and what's going on with them. Uh, this is uh, a nice sort of visual figure from uh, more of like a human disease and, and global disease perspective, looking at different scales of disease. So, uh, you know, you have, have individuals inf infecting each other uh, at, at small time scales, hours to days, and you have uh, epidemics and pandemics at the, the, the decadal or years to month. We're all much more familiar with that now than we used to be. And this is a picture of a bass that I took snorkeling underwater in my cottage in Ontario with a giant uh, tapeworm of uh, unidentified species. I'm not really an expert in that, but I thought that was quite wild to see. And, and you know, the, these interactions happen very commonly in nature, uh, diseases, parasites, pathogens. Uh, you know, in, in humans now we have lots of vaccinations and treatments so that we don't get all sorts of diseases, but in, in, in animals, these these pathogens and parasites are, are very common and they affect everything from physiology to behavior to life history all the interactions that we're trying to measure about animals, these underlying factors of disease are really influencing a lot of them. So uh, some terms we're gonna be using here, pathogen, uh, an infectious agent, so something that infects uh, different individuals that can lead to a disease. Uh, a carrier can have signals of a, of a, a pathogen, so they can, they can actually be a host for a pathogenic species, a bacteria, a virus, or a parasite, but they, they may not have a disease. Uh, and so the disease is, is the clinical condition caused by a pathogen. So, so a, an animal with a disease caused by a pathogen is a carrier, uh, but a carrier may not have a disease. Uh, and etiology is like a, a fancy word for a, a causal mechanism for a disease. So you can have an etiolo etiological agent would be a, a, a pathogen that causes a disease so like COVID-19, the etiological agent would be the coronavirus um, and migration. So I talked a bit about migration here. There's a lot of different definitions of migration. There's human, demographic definitions of migration. And of course there's ecological animal definitions of migration. So a persistent and directed synchronous movement is typically symptomatic of, of an animal migration. But there, there are many different definitions and there's you know, half a dozen papers trying to define what is migration uh, and how can we unite migration for insects and birds and bats and, uh, and fish and, and terrestrial animals and, and it, it, 
it's challenging, but just in general, keep in mind migration, thinking about uh, these the synchronous movements often uh, by some onids. Not often, but in this context, they'll be talking about some onids. So disease is something that happens to all migratory animals. It's something that is, is, is really entrenched in the biology of migration. And it's something that I think is really interesting. This is a great paper by Sonia Altizer, uh, Animal Migration and Infectious Disease Risk. It's in science. Uh, and, and it has this really great visualization uh, of, of how disease can both be kind of a driver of migration. So there's hypotheses that suggest that animals may migrate to escape pathogenic agents. Uh, and, and avoid disease, uh, but it can also be a, a consequence of migration. So animals move into areas where the disease agents exist that they would never have encountered had they not migrated. So, so there's these sort of feedback loops in, in migration and disease that are, that are quite interesting and, and the causal mechanisms, the, the cause and effect are, are hard to disentangle. And, and this is a paper that I, I was a part of with uh, Jacqueline Chapman, who's a, a researcher now with BC Hydro. We did our PhDs together at Carleton. And, uh, we did some tagging of the Atlantic salmon in Hamilton River in Newfoundland. Uh, so uh, there's a road here, a river goes around this island, and there's a counting fence that DFO operates, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And we caught the fish at the counting fence, and then we sampled it. We brought it back down uh, to here and then let it migrate back up. And we continued to do that to get the progression of the disease in the individual, uh, which was a really interesting design. You can see over time, uh, you get quite interesting disease dynamics. So some of these uh, pathogens, uh, signs and signals of disease increase fairly steadily through the migration. So, uh, so as time goes on, they start to get a higher load of this uh, tet tetracapsuloides. Uh, some of them start to develop this uh, fisky chlamydia, uh, and then some of it is, is, is quite noisy. It's hard to figure out exactly. And, and there, of course, they're marine pathogens. Uh, there are freshwater pathogens. So, so the dynamics, among, and, and they're also co-infections. So uh, some pathogens uh, promote the occurrence of other pathogens. So, so these dynamics can be quite difficult to disentangle uh, and very interesting to use these sort of experimental approaches. This experimental displacement, I thought was a really unique design to, to try to understand the progression of disease in these animals. And there's something called migratory culling, which I think is, is very interesting. And, and it's the idea that uh, animals that get diseased during the migration usually, usually are forced to drop out of the migration usually because they die. Uh, and and this, this paper in uh, Journal of Animal Ecology uh, goes through all the different costs that, are, that have been studied for migratory animals of getting sick or getting diseases. And uh, you can see there's, they, they explored the effects on body stores, so fat stores, which is a, a very important resource for a migrating animal. Uh, effects on movement, so changes in movement patterns as a consequence of disease and, uh, in, in various uh, species. Phenology, so the time of the migration, survival. Uh, you can see survival tends to really just de decrease as a result of pathogens. So you can see that there's all these ecological interactions. That are, that are caused by disease for migratory species. And so uh, oftentimes we're doing lots of studies on migratory species and, and either unable or uh, unwilling in some ways to, to sample the pathogens of the animal that, that we're following or instrumenting. Uh, and and I, I think it's more often unable I and mean, I'd be very interested to always have a, a comprehensive understanding of the diseases carried by an animal that we're, that we're tracking. But for many species, uh, we don't really know. We haven't sequenced all of the species, or for many, the, the pathogens or the parasites are in the heart or the liver, and you can't non lethally sample someone's heart uh, and then track them for uh, hundreds of kilometers and understand the, their migration. So uh, it is challenging, but, but for some species, especially the salmonids, where the, the disease profiles are, are quite well studied, and we have the tools that we need to actually sample them non lethally, to take the biopsy and then, and then follow them, these kind of approaches. Uh, combining the tracking and the, and the, the disease are, are really powerful tools for inference and, and understanding ecological dynamics. And uh, I mean, another amazing paper, so these are you know, mostly not my work, it's a uh, really great background though. Uh, uh, Nathan Fury, who's uh, the, an alumnus of, of Ocean Tracking Networks, now a professor at University of New Hampshire in the US, uh, worked with Scott Hinch out in BC for his PhD. Um, they were able to, to sample 
uh, smolts. These are Atlantic salmon smolts because that's what I had photos of in my uh, my my own archive. But they were studying sockeye salmon smolts, and they actually removed smolts from the stomachs of predators, sampled those eaten smolts for signals of, of virus, and then compared the, the loads of virus in the smolts that have been eaten to the loads of virus in the broader population captured just based on the survey program and found that, uh, maybe not unsurprisingly, but, but imp very importantly, that uh, the predated smolts had, had much higher uh, diversity of, of pathogenic species, uh, and as well as uh, I think that they looked at one specific virus, which was IHNV, uh, that was that seemed to be a significant driver of uh, of predation by the bull trout. So uh, this is kind of indicating that there are there are signals of potential compensatory mortality uh, in diseased animals. So. Uh, you have these these additional this additional layer of ecological interactions, where uh, predators are are selectively removing individuals that have disease from a population, which is which is extremely important because a, a lot of the other research that I do is focused on questions about predation. Predation is a huge topic that I'm interested in, and a lot of my my research focuses on predation and, and, and conflicts with predation, humans and predators, fishers and predators, uh, and, and understanding that the predators are selective to some extent, and, and they're not necessarily randomly taking individuals out of a population, and that they're actually removing individuals that are sick or compromised is a really important ecosystem dynamic that exists in nature, and, and, uh, and that I think, or I, I hypothesize, is really underappreciated uh, in questions of, of conflict between humans and predators, especially you know predators that are taking sockeye salmon in this system where, where Nathan's been working are often suggested to be persecuted. So you know if we just remove the bull trout, then more of the sockeye salmon smolts will make it to the ocean. We'll have more sockeye salmon. But if in fact they're eating the ones that are diseased and those sockeye salmon smolts would die of disease anyway, then you don't have the, the, the same sort of dynamic as you thought you did. So very interesting. Uh, so where I'm working in Norway, this is a view from like a mountaintop. This is a fjord uh, going out here. The river kind of goes out here up into the mountains. Um, and, and, and this fjord is full of, fi of fish farms, among many other, others in Norway. Fish farms uh, are you know, very important for producing food, according to some. Um, but they aggregate, you know, millions of salmon. So uh, one net pen in, in Norway will have over 100,000 Atlantic salmon in it. And like the whole wild population of, of Atlantic salmon in Norway is like less than half a million probably. Maybe, maybe a million, you know, different models. You can't really know exactly, but you know, it, one net pen is like a significant percentage of all of the wild salmon in the total country. And I mean, one fjord will have dozens of net pens. It's quite, quite wild. So there's a system in Norway called the traffic light system now, which is based on uh, an expert group uh, that tries to identify the, uh, the risk of uh, the risk to the wild salmon caused by fish farming. One of the major risks caused by fish farming is proliferation of parasites and pathogens. You get a really high host density. It creates a, a reservoir for disease and that can spill over uh, to, to wild salmon. So you can see that this is where sort of running the gauntlet of climate change comes where you get this, uh, this pattern from north to south where the southern areas of Norway are still are, are quite uh, heavily leveraged towards fish farming. You get these yellow areas, this red area. Uh, this is not an up-to-date map. I think it's two years old, uh, but it's, it's, it's fairly consistent with the current status. Uh, but as these waters are warming, going north, fish farming is starting to move into these northern areas. So there, there's potential changes in, in, the, in the risk landscape for wild salmon uh, and exposure to pathogens that are spilling back associated with the change in climate and the change in, in, in industry pressure. So you can see uh, these red areas, that's estimated more than 30% mortality of the salmon smolts caused by or attributed to the effects of salmon lice, which is a natural parasite, but it, that is uh, extremely overabundant because of, of fish farming. So, it, I mean, you know, 30% mortality 
or more. It's, it's a striking number for a, for a, an entire fjord system or an area. So we recently kind of published this paper uh, focused on some uh, some work with pit tagging, uh, demonstrating that uh, the there does seem to be a strong connection sort of underlying this uh, this management system uh, in connecting the the parasites to the the fish farms and parasites of course external parasites like like, like salmon lice are quite easy to detect. You, know, you, you count them, you see them, they're on the fish, they're there. This is, this is a good example of a, of a pathogen because it's so, it's so visual, it, you, you can't miss it unless you're not looking for it. But there's so many other pathogens that may have similar impacts on these animals that you simply cannot see or cannot count. And that's that's sort of the, the, the foundations of this research program is trying to, to sample the, the pathogens uh, that, you, that you can't see. So a bit more background on salmon lice because it, it's an important sort of uh, uh, representative of how pathogens can influence fish. Uh, so there's evidence, strong evidence that fish farms are the causal agent for salmon lice in fjords in Norway. Uh, this is, of course, debated by a small percentage of, of people that, that, you know, that's how it is, present both sides. There's overwhelmingly strong evidence that that's the case, but uh, it's, you know, there's still some debate. Uh, there is a correlation specifically between the, the lice loads in farms, or sorry, the, the infestation pressure from farms and the lice loads on wild salmon. So several papers have shown this. Uh, infestation pressure is sort of a model of the number of eggs produced by the lice and how they're propagated out to the fjord. So more lice reproducing inside the farms, you get more lice on the wild salmon migrating past the farms. That includes the sea trout as well. Uh, salmon lice has an impact on Wild salmonids, salmon and sea trout. So uh, there's there's several studies showing that that even low levels of infestation of lice cause physiological impacts and can alter uh, survival, other life history aspects. These same studies are often lacking for other pathogens. Uh, this is somewhat to emphasize that we know a lot about one specific parasite, but there's dozens of different pathogens, viruses, bacteria that that we don't often have the same level of knowledge about. Uh, but this, we, we know that we have the same dynamics, that they're often proliferating within farms and spreading uh, to the wild salmon from farms. Uh, there's a chemical called emamectin benzoate, which was developed for uh, agriculture to get rid of pest species insects. And that has been used to treat salmon against lice because they have the same sort of, uh, it, it affects the, the development of chitin, which is uh, important for the development and reproduction of lice. Uh, so in order to estimate the, the impact of lice on wild salmon, you treat half of, you treat a, a group with abomectin benzoate and you have a, an untreated group, uh, you tag 5,000 of each, you release them all. And the number that you get back as adults, the proportion of, of each group should indicate the relative impact of, of lice. But, or sorry, uh, and, and so when they're treated with amamectin benzoate, they have higher propensity to, to return. So they're treated against the lice, they don't get as much lice, they have a higher survival, indicating a direct causal relationship between uh, vulnerability to lice infestation and uh, marine survival. And we also showed in a paper a couple of years ago that uh, actually, uh, if you're treated with amamectin benzoate, you have a lower survival inherently. So the, the actual treatment already reduces your survival, but you still have a better survival than if you were untreated and actually exposed to lice. So even the, the models that use these randomized control treatments are underestimating the impact of sea lice because you're having a higher mortality in the, 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 treat, the treated group inherently. Uh, and, and overall, 
models from uh, from Norway indicate that uh, lice infestations are 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 uh, meaningfully affecting the the salmon populations. So that that's a lot of background just to say that you know in contemporary times we have stressors that are impacting wild salmonids in these fjords, and we don't have a really good handle on exactly the mechanisms uh, that are occurring. And, and we, we also, this is very important, we have a behavioral response of sea trout, which unlike Atlantic salmon, they don't go all the way out, uh, uh, far out to, the, the, to Greenland and uh, the Faroe Islands and Svalbard for feeding. The sea trout, they stay close to the fjords, so overlapping a lot with the, with the fish farms. And, and they actually return early to the rivers because the physiological impacts of lice is that they, they sort of chew through the mucus layer of the fish, it exposes the fish to seawater and causes an osmotic imbalance. So uh, you may have studied uh, physi physiology and of freshwater and marine fish, as I did when I was an undergrad at Dalhousie taking physiology of marine animals. And you know, the os osmotic balance is very important to fish and the, the mucus layer is important for maintaining that os osmotic balance. So basically when the lice choose through the mucus, they become dehydrated because they get a lot of salt coming in and they have to go back to fresh water to drink essentially and restore osmotic balance. So uh, infested fish are uh, returning to fresh water very quickly. So they're not able to feed and grow in the fjords as much. And Dylan Shea, who's a postdoc at Norse right now, I uh, did a PhD uh, out west with uh, Christy and with Martin Kosick at the uh, University of Toronto and showed that uh, with eDNA, there, there's, there's evidence of, of pathogen dispersal. So lots of different bacteria and viruses uh, and, and, and parasites that are, that are spreading from, from the fish farms out into the, the water. So they're, they're, they're modeling the, uh, the amount of, of pathogen, pathogenic eDNA and how it's spreading away from the farms and how it potentially infecting fish that are migrating past. So we, we sort of came up with this, uh, this project on uh, PACE. So uh, it, we focused really on sea trout uh, and, and we wanted to know how the potential change in the climate and the, and the warming of the waters uh, as you go from south to north is, and, and the projected increase in the, uh, in the number, in the amount of fish farming moving north where it becomes warmer and it's opening up, uh, opportunities for new farms in the north is potentially affecting uh, the, the salmonids uh, in these, these northern areas. And to do that, we, uh, we decided to, to work with Christy Miller to, to leverage uh, her capacity and competence in uh, high, throughput, high throughput genomics and studying, uh, stu uh, studying the, the, path, the host and the pathogen gene expression from fish, uh, as well as telemetry. So, so trying to track the sea trail in the fjords and trying to understand where they're moving, how they're behaving, and how this is potentially influenced by their, their pathogen loads. So sea trout is, is, is quite an amazing species. Uh, there's a lot of animals that are called sea trout. There's uh, the spotted sea trout or weak fish in Florida that is, is not a salmonid. It's, it's, a, it's really a perch and, and bass. And, uh, and, and uh, we have in Nova Scotia, we have sea trout that are sea run brook trout or salters, uh, different species. The, the sea trout in Norway is, is I try to write as much as possible, sea run brown trout, but it's a bit of a, a mouthful. So the, the trout have a very flexible life history. They can stay in the river. They can grow up, live their entire life in the river and reproduce. Uh, they can go very briefly to salt water for like days or weeks and stay just around the estuary, or they can really go hundreds of kilometers away from their home river uh, into another different river and a different fjord system. We've been tracking sea trout in Western Norway for some years now. We see them on pretty much every receiver that we put out. There's always sea trout around. They go hundreds of kilometers and, and most of them come back to the river. They can even, we found they, they're even spawning in the estuary uh, 30 kilometers from the river. So these fjords are, uh, you know, brackish water uh, for, for many tens of kilometers. And in areas where there's sufficient flow and substrate, they're actually spawning, uh, you know, tens of kilometers away from the river in the estuary, which is, which is wild. Uh, so really complex life history. I guess I can <laughs> spend an hour on this, but uh, what we're interested in is these marine adults. So they, they go out uh, from the river where they grew up as par, they go out as small, 
they usually come back as an immature non-spawner after one year. It's called a Blencha in Norwegian or Finnick and they call that in Scotland and Ireland. Uh, and then they go back out again and they usually get quite big and they start to reproduce uh, and they go back into, into the rivers and, and spawn. So we're usually trapping, we're usually catch, catching them uh, in this study uh, in the marine environment or in freshwater, putting a tag and, and following them moving in between the freshwater uh, and the marine environment. And, and sea trout in Norway is, is uh, a really interesting uh, um, population structure. About 10,000 years ago, there was an ice age and Norway, most of Norway was iced over. Uh, and at about that time, it's the, the ice started to recede and uh, a lot of the trout populations from the south started to recolonize Norway because uh, pre-ice age, they, they probably lived in Norway. So a lot of these rivers, I mean, the, the populations are about 10,000 years old according to the knowledge that I have. There might be some debate because it's not really my field, but essentially about 10,000 years ago, all these rivers started to get recolonized. And you see that some, some genetic structuring. So uh, you don't know these names, obviously, I apologize, but uh, Western Norway, you have Hardangerfjord and, and Grunenzelda is, is a river within Hardangerfjord. Um, and you see it's sort of a genetic cluster in the West. You see a genetic cluster in central Norway, the uh, Murrell Rumsdal, uh, all these and uh, you see the sort of the, the Trondelag, this is the Trondheim Sjord, it's a very large system, you have a genetic cluster there. And then most of the north is fairly homogenous, so Troms and Finnmark, Tromsø is somewhere up here, and Finnmark is this province up here. So the, yeah, you have a really interesting genetic structuring of this, of this population. And Sten Carlson at the Norwegian Institute for Nature Research is the geneticist for, for much of Norway, uh, for the Salmonids that he's put this together. I'm going to check the time because I have no idea how well I'm doing on time. You're good. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and this is kind of important because the, the fact that we have this, this structuring of genetics indicates that there's probably adaptation to the specific areas. And, and one important adaptation that has been seen in other species is changes in disease resistance through the major histocompatibility complex. So as you move northwards for Atlantic salmon, uh, Melanie Dion indicated that you have uh, lower allelic risk richness and lower pathogen resistance. And this is presumably an adaptation that occurs because at high latitudes for these species, the diversity of pathogens and the replication rate for pathogens is slower. So as you move northwards, you don't need to invest as heavily into pathogen resistance because the pathogens that you're vulnerable to reproduce slower because it's cold. And they may not even exist there because it's too cold. And that's a, that suggests that for sea trout, we, we predict that in the northern areas, there's probably inherently lower allelic richness and lower investment in major histocompatibility complexes that help stave off disease for the species. Now, that's just a hypothesis. So that's part of the project that we're trying to test. Let's get this again. Uh, so again, back to this figure, as we project increased biomass of fish farming moving northwards, we project increased pathogenic loads for these species in the north that based on theory, we project to have lower <coughs> capacity to handle disease. And so again, I thought I would have, not again, but I, I was supposed to have some results from this by now, but I don't. Uh, so uh, what we have been doing is, uh, is sampling sea trout from throughout Norway to gather the information that we need about the allelic richness and the major histocompatibility complexes and the pathogen risk richness. So we have samples from uh, far, far south of Norway. This is where Oslo is, capital is. Norway is great for these studies because you have this long coastline that goes north to south, uh, but Oslo doesn't really count <laughs> because it's, it goes up again here. And it's, it's more facing towards uh, different ocean basins. So we started in Flekkefjord. Uh, we took samples kind of all the way up the coast. 
Uh, this is Harrios, and this is around Bergen. This is where I've lived for the last several years. Uh, up the coast, we have samples all the way up into the Arctic. So, I mean, Russia is like right here in Finland and Sweden. So, uh, this is 71 degrees north, very high uh, latitudes, very long winters, uh, very cold, and, and very interested to see the, the pathogen richness that we, that we uh, are able to detect in these populations, as well as the allelic richness and the major histocompatibility complexes. And at some point in the near future, I hope, we'll have some results on this and I'll be sure to share those. Uh, but how do pathogens affect migration? So we had two, uh, three additional questions about the impact of the pathogens on the actual movements and migrations of the sea trout. As I, as I described earlier, they're born in the rivers, they move out to the sea to feed, uh, exposed to totally different pathogenic species, come back into fresh water, either to overwinter or to spawn, both, uh, and exposed to another suite of pathogenic species, parasites, viruses that are specifically fresh water. Uh, this is, I love this picture. This is a, a river in northern Norway called uh, Bayerelva, and this is a tributary that's coming in with really clear water, and you can get glacial water coming out of the sea in here. It's really beautiful. Uh, and this is another river we were working in, trying to look at the, the migration farther south in Norway near, near Bergen. This is where I've been living, it's uh, amazing. It's a beautiful spot. It's the fjord and the summer you go out there. It's like light 24 hours a day. It's, uh, yeah, beautiful. And, and so how do we actually sample for disease for fish that we want to survive? Uh, I mean, the alternative is you can cut them open, take their heart, put them in a vial and send it, for, uh, send it to the lab to, to look at the, the pathogen DNA. But increasingly we want to actually be able to pair the knowledge of the disease, the host and the pathogen gene, ex gene expression with some movement data of the animal. So for many species, you can actually take gill samples. It sounds crazy. I would not want someone to cut a part of my lung, but the anterior gill filaments uh, can be removed uh, with, with relatively low impact uh, on the animal. Uh, so we take a small gill sample and preserve that in, uh, in, in a solution and send that to the lab, and, and the animal is able to, to survive, thrive uh, very easily with, with that kind of sample. We, we put a tag in it, and we follow it. So we, we get a snapshot. We don't get you know, progression throughout its life uh, the way we did with the, one of the first slides I showed you where we did the repeated sampling of the individuals, the, the recapture. We get a snapshot of, of the individual status. Okay, how, what pathogens does it have at this point in its life, uh, and how is that affecting it moving forward? So this is great. A uh, paper by Jacqueline Chapman, again, a uh, former colleague uh, uh, in, in Steve's lab. Uh, they, and they looked at different methods for investigating pathogenic agents. So you can look at eDNA, as Dylan Shea did with his PhD. Uh, you can look at histology, uh, that where you, you cut the animal open, you take samples from the heart, the liver, the, the spleen, uh, and look at all the different organs and, and the pathogens. Uh, or you can do what we're doing here. So host tissue biopsy or swab. And, and, and these are criticized, of course, because you don't really truly know the pathogens that are in the heart necessarily, but validations of, of, the, uh, of the tissue biopsies or swabs indicate that you get a pretty good overall idea of, of, the, of the pathogens. And, and there is pathogen DNA that is circulating uh, in, the, in the animal that, that is detected in the gill tissue, even if it's not a pathogen that specifically uh, affects the gills. And telemetry, my favorite. Uh, this is what I do. This is my, you know, the my my reason to be. Uh, we we track fish in the ocean and the rivers and lakes. Uh, this great paper from uh, Nigel Cussey and of course Sarah was involved uh, in, in science, sort of overviewing all the different methods of tracking uh, fish in the ocean. You know, light based geolocation, depth tags, um, getting three D models, and uh, looking at uh, temperature, thermal uh, thermal behavior. So so all these fish. Uh, these sea trout that we tagged in the two rivers in Bayerel, the northern Norway, and uh, in Balso in, in, in western Norway, the farther south. Uh, we, we took the gill samples, the biopsies, to look at the pathogen gene expression and host gene expression, and we tagged them to look at their movements. And, and we had a few hypotheses about that. So the receiver network, we established these uh, locations with, uh, with acoustic receivers. So we put a battery in them, attach it to an anchor, and put it on the bottom of the river, on the bottom of the fjord. Uh, and, and the, the tags that we have uh, send out a signal on uh, 69 kilohertz. And when it's within range of the receiver, it gets detected and the information from the tag gets logged on the receiver. And so each, each of these tags has 
an individual ID so we know, okay, wh who was the fish that was seen here. But we also put uh, acceleration sensors so we know the activity of the fish and temperature sensors so we know the, the, the temperature that the fish is experiencing. And the tagging process, so here's a nice beautiful sea trout. Those are my hands, I think. Uh, Yep, that's me and, and Lotta who's working on our PhD right now. Uh, we're tagging uh, the sea trout, so make an incision, put the tag in, suture it closed, take the hose out of its mouth, bring it back to the river, and fish swims away. Works quite well. Get great data from it. And, and, and specifically for the PACE project, uh, we're, this is uh, Lisa Stoger. She used to work with us in Cecilia, now doing a PhD with, uh, with us. Uh, you know, catching fish out of these nets, uh, putting the tags in and taking the gill sample uh, and, and releasing them out. So we did this with you know, 100, 103 trout from, from these two rivers over a couple of years. And, and, and we also had some archive data that we used uh, as, as a pilot project to sort of proof of concept to make sure this would work from Shasta Fjord and Tucson Fjord, which is two areas in Northern Norway. Uh, and we and we had samples from overwintering trout, so they were in the river already. Uh, and and we looked at pathogens. So these are just pathogen codes. Uh, uh, Ichthyobota was very prevalent in both fjords, and you and you can kind of see a trend that uh, regardless of the, the of the fjord of the system, they're they're quite separated. Uh, but we have general patterns that the, the same pathogens are prevalent, uh, and just at, at maybe a higher uh, higher numbers. So. Flavobacterium psychophyllium, that's a, a very ubiquitous bacterium in, uh, in Salmonids. You see it in Arctic char in Nunavut, you see it in the Pacific Ocean, you see it in Atlantic Canada, you see it in Norway. Many Salmonids are infected with flavobacterium. And you can have flavobacterium, you can be a carrier without having a disease, but the disease caused by flavobacterium is cold water disease. So it, it makes you think that it'll be more prevalent in cold areas, but it doesn't seem to be the case from my uh, experience. And then we have some rare ones as well. So uh, tennis and baculum, uh, um, and I don't remember what that one is, but we didn't see very much. But so you, you see, we have these, these sort of the suite of common pathogens, so the, the uncommon and the, and the rare pathogens. And just to sort of show uh, an area where we're working, we, we tag them here in the fjord. They would have to migrate around here. We detect them all the way up. And there's a small stretch of river. We'd uh, track them in uh, several locations. And then a lake, so kind of a unique, a, a different habitat type, slow moving, deep, uh, cold, cold water on the bottom. And then they can move back up into the river, uh, a little bit warmer in here, uh, and then another big lake and, and a final shorter stretch of river uh, up here. So, so we have receivers all the way up so we can track them going up and going down. We can look at different behavioral attributes of the fish uh, and try to test hypotheses and associate how they're moving with, with the pathogens that, that, that they, uh, they have on them. Uh, this is another fjord system. So this is the, the Bayer Alva where I showed the, uh, the picture of the two rivers that we're meeting. Uh, again, a big complex fjord system, uh, still the fjord, the estuary, uh, river starting here, and you start to see different migration patterns. So, you have date here, you have longitude. So uh, longitude is just sort of like, are they moving this way? Uh, and you see this one is hanging out, it's tagged early August, this is 2020. So uh, mid, mid pandemic in Norway, we're still able to field work. That was quite a miracle. Um, so this trout was hanging out for quite a while in the estuary. You can see the temperature based on the temperature tag. Uh, it, it was quite warm in the estuary. That's quite nice for it. Uh, and then all of a sudden it went into the river, migrated up and started to hang out near where it was probably gonna spawn in the river. And when it did that, you know, it's kind of interesting, it, it got quite cold. So, so they're modulating their, uh, their, their temperature experience based on their habitat use in a way. And this is sort of the, the outcome that we get when we try to put this all together. So uh, these two fjords for the pilot project that we had, uh, Shasta Fjord and Tucson Fjord, uh, we use this tool called the non-metric multidimensional scaling where we put all of the pathogens and all of the host genes into a bin, and we try to pull out uh, two main dimensions. And, and we actually got three. I'm only showing two right here because a three-dimensional plot is, is kind of crazy, uh, you know, even though this is also a little bit difficult to see. And, and you can see where the pathogens sort of are oriented on here as well. So each of these points is a fish. The color indicates which, which fjord it came from. And if these, are, if these two fjords were very different in terms of their pathogen community, I would expect to see 
really different uh, uh, sort of ranges for these two colored uh, colored polygons. If they were very different, you'd see yellow up here, blue down here. But in fact, they're quite overlapping, which is exactly what we saw in, in the figure that I showed. Uh, and then we orient some of the, the pathogens on here. And we see that uh, you know some of these individuals from Tusenfjord have uh, uh, are associated with these pathogens, but in general, uh, there's no strong associations. There's no no strong indicator species to say, okay, in this fjord, this pathogen is quite common, uh, and, that, and that was quite interesting. And, and these other these are not pathogens. The gray boxes, those are host genes. So uh, there, there's a, a suite of host genes that exist. Uh, in these panels, so we can look at viral disease development related genes that get turned on and off. We can look at thermal stress genes that get turned on and off. I'm not going to dive too much into that right now because I think I'm running out of time and that's a whole other topic for another day. Uh, but in general, the takeaway here is we don't see necessarily strong differentiation in the pathogens between the fjords. Uh, and and, and when, when I tried to put in some of the movement metrics in this particular study, didn't see strong associations either. So time in fresh water was. Uh, associated with some of these, these genes, which makes sense. These are smultification genes, so osmoregulation, osmoregulatory genes. So you'd expect them to be up or down regulated based on whether or not they're in fresh or salt water, uh, but, but not strong associations between fresh water and, and any pathogens. Those are sort of oriented almost in, in a different direction. Uh, so behavioral fever is something we were kind of interested in. We, we wanted to see, we wanted to test whether or not uh, fish with high loads of pathogens were actually strategically using different areas of the fjords uh, to uh, experience different temperatures. So using temperature as a resource in, in mammals, when we're sick, we elevate our temperature uh, to try to fight the pathogen. Fish have no such mechanism. So they actually have to find uh, an area of a river or an area of the ocean. Uh, where they have the opportunity to elevate their body temperature based on their external environment. And there's evidence that the animals do this, ectothermic animals do this in order to fight pathogens. So the theory was, was, was quite strong. There's some lab studies on behavioral fever. I took this just to show sort of a graphical uh, illustration. I couldn't come up with my own uh, illustration of behavioral fever. And, and, and there's a really nice paper in uh, B that uh, about behavioral fever in uh, in fish, so it does exist uh, in theory in fish. Uh, did we did we see it? Uh, Jury is still out. Uh, not strong evidence that the fish with pathogens were sitting at different at uh, different temperatures. We had the temperature transmitting tags to actually know what temperatures each fish was experiencing. Uh, so we had the data to to test this hypothesis. And this is sort of where we're at with this analysis. Each color here is a different fish, uh, and we have week of twenty twenty. So uh, you know, midsummer up until week 52, so you know, Christmas and New Year's, uh, and you can see there's there's some individual differences. So this this individual was consistently sitting at a warmer temperature later in the years, uh, but but in general we see just a strong the, the the strongest predictor of temperature is is time because they're, they're they're experiencing the temperatures that are available to them, which isn't overly surprising, but it certainly does not. In this preliminary sense, support the, the hypothesis necessarily that there's there's enough evidence of individual variation that could be connected in theory to, to the pathogen. So I was really excited about, about this hypothesis. I thought, wow, if, you know, if we identify this, you know, it'd be a really nice, uh, really nice piece of, of, of the puzzle in trying to understand climate and uh, behavior and pathogens. Uh, and, and, and we'll see what comes out when we actually put out the analysis, you know, this, this isn't a formal analysis, but, you know, bringing you along for the ride, see what I'm, see what I'm working on on a day-to-day -day basis here. We also want to look at overwintering activity and overall acceleration. So as fish move, they, uh, they mostly beat the tail, they use the fins a little bit, but this axial movement of the individual, uh, creates energy and that can be logged with an acceleration sensor. So these tags have an X, Y, Z. Uh, accelerometer. They can measure movement in three dimensions. Uh, so you have uh, uh, pitch, uh, yaw, and roll, which are the three three axes. And, and there's this great paper that I referenced like a bajillion times uh, by by Gleis et al. showing that that yes, these these measures of acceleration do approximate the energy expenditure of an animal. So so more activity, more energy expenditure. Uh, less activity, more energy savings. And for a migratory animal that, uh, for which energy is a very important resource and a strong indicator of fitness often, 
energy conservation can be very important. Uh, and, and pathogens can certainly influence, uh, in theory, the, the energy expenditure of the animal. So uh, all, all I have for you on that is, is uh, a look at, at, at the overwintering activity levels that we have in the two rivers, so Stjordal and Bosso. Uh, and, and you can see that uh, in both rivers, we see a really steep decline in, in activity metrics right around December, which, which is sort of post-spawning. So these are sort of higher signals of activity pre-spawning, or sorry, during spawning, which makes sense. You know, they're, they're quite active. Uh, and then during, during the overwintering period, they really shut down their activity. They, they don't move very much. They're conserving energy. And then uh, May, June, they start to ramp up their activity again as they start to turn on uh, with the, the, the temperature warming and, and they're going out to the fjord. So uh, again, these are sort of the data that we're going to use to test the hypothesis that the pathogens may be influencing part of their, uh, their migration activity and their overwintering. And Cinder is the postdoc on this. He actually visited Dalhousie as part of his PhD many years ago. Um, not many years ago, like three or four years ago. It's unfair to him. Uh, so we have a swim tunnel respirometer at, at NTNU in Trondheim, uh, and he's been catching uh, trout in the fjord and putting a tag in them. Uh, and you can see here that there's a receiver in the tank. So he, he puts the swim tunnel, sets it to different uh, swimming speeds, forcing the fish to swim. And then we can, uh, we can relate the water speed to the amount of activity in the fish. And then there's an oxygen probe in here and we can measure how much oxygen the fish is using. Uh, and we can develop a relationship between the activity derived from the tag and the energy consumption of the fish. So a few, a few sort of takeaways from why I think this is interesting, where I wanna go with this and how we're gonna continue, continue to develop this, uh, I, I referenced the predator issue. Uh, and and I, I think it's really interesting, the question of whether or not predators are actually selective for pathogens and, and having a positive influence on, a, on ecological communities and, and certainly aquatic communities in terms of limiting disease transfer and spread within populations. Uh, predators in that sense would be very bad for an individual. They kill them, but potentially, quite good for a population. They limit the spread of a disease. Uh, and, and, and we see circumstantial evidence for this, and uh, I won't go into that right now, but there, there's, a, there, there's some examples I see in ecology where, where disease has become a problem and, and, and you can almost, it feels like you can sometimes draw a straight line between the fact that, well, predators have been removed from that area uh, and, and disease is spreading and, and causing problems. It, it doesn't surprise me. I can't say it's a, it's, it's a mechanistic relationship because I haven't tested it, but observationally, I, I see this, this signals there. Uh, predator parasite trade off manifest behavior. Look at this trend. That's, that's not quite as pretty as the other ones I've been showing. That one was quite a cool one to get. That's a tough life living on the fjord, trying to escape seals and whales and, uh, and, uh, and, and pathogens. So, uh, this, this is a really cool paper showing that parasites sort of influence animals to separate from each other because they don't want to transmit those, those pathogens to each other. But predators push animals together because for many species, uh, schooling or shoaling or, or, or being together reduces the individual risk of predation. So you have this, this really fascinating trade-off and risk effects in the environment that animals have to navigate. Uh, and, and I think we know very little about how that actually operates, especially for these species uh, that are moving out to really risky environments. Like freshwater is relatively safe for these animals. Of course, there's birds, there's herons, there's otters, uh, there's mink, uh, there, there's bigger fish that are eating them, but, but, but the marine environment is, is, is really risky. And there, there's many more predators and, and pathogens. So uh, the reason that they go out to the marine environment is that it, it's also very productive. They grow much better in the marine environment. It, and, and, and so far the, for them, the trade-off is worth it. They, they die a lot, but they continue to do it. <laughs> they, they keep going out um, and, and, uh, and really understanding how these risk effects operate uh, in these diverse ways in, in the environment is, is fascinating. And of course, we all, we, we're adding in the anthropogenic stressors now as well. I mean, fisheries are a totally additional mortality risk effect for some of these species, uh, not to mention other ones, uh, you know, infrastructure, boating, uh, um, fish farming. So we, we see evidence uh, in Norway that some small trout and salmon actually swim into the fish farms because there's a lot of food and a lot of activity there. 
and then they get trapped and they live their, the rest of their life in the fish farm until they get harvested with the rest of the, the stockfish. So uh, th there's definitely risk effects there as well. And who influences whom? I, I can't get my head around this for this system, but there, there has to be dynamics uh, of, uh, of the pathogens and the parasites actually affect, like, like consciously affecting the behavior of the animals. We see it in, uh, uh, in insects and, and other species with parasites that actually influence their, their behavior and cognition. Uh, and and uh, for a migratory species, I mean, freshwater parasites and pathogens should want to keep their host in fresh water and keep it from going to salt water where it might, might, might kill them. So our pathogens and parasites of these animals actually influence in their behavior to stop them from moving across habitats or stop them from, uh, from engaging in certain behaviors. Uh, or, or do trout actually, and, and species actually still have agency. So can they just say, uh oh, I'm infected. I'm gonna go to the salt water and, and wash off this parasite. We know very little about that. Uh, I, I mentioned the example before of trout moving into fresh water to, to osmoregulate after being infected with salmon lice. Uh, I think it's, it's not clear whether or not they're doing that to kill the lice or to restore osmoregulation. I think it's probably more osmoregulation, but certainly, you know, moving into fresh water and, and bathing off the lice is, is an effective strategy as well. So that there's evidence of this agency uh, potentially to, uh, uh, to get rid of pathogens. And, uh, and, and there may, we didn't find evidence of agency in terms of like the behavioral thermoregulation and the behavioral fever, but that's another mechanism that there may be agency in the, the individuals to, uh, to limit the spread or limit the development of pathogens. Uh, and some more research, I think, would be really cool on this topic. So can, can knowledge of disease lead us to better management? Uh, this model of sufficient and component causes of mortality is something that I've been working on in Norway with Knut. It's sort of a, uh, an epi epidemiological model uh, of mortality, of risk effects. You know, uh, you have obesity plus smoking. Uh, may be a sufficient cause only in combination for a certain fraction of the population. And, and disease plus predation is probably a sufficient cause, uh, even if disease alone is not a sufficient cause. So, so better understanding how uh, disease, predation, anthropogenic effects, uh, and, and other factors combine to form some fit, sufficient versus component causes is, is a really interesting area of research. Uh, compensatory, defining compensatory and additive mortality studies like Nathan Fury's, I, I love that. It's inspired me very much. Uh, I'll probably tell him that in person one day when I see him. Uh, I think that's really cool and really hard to do in ecology. Uh, and really, the, these pathogens and parasites, they're often a missing link in understanding ecology uh, and evolution to, uh, to some degree. So uh, finding ways to use these species, like the Salmons, where we have the tools, we have the knowledge of which, which pathogens are affecting them to, to test these hypotheses, hypotheses is valuable, but also supporting the development of new screening programs to better understand pathogens and species that we don't necessarily have uh, a full comprehension of which pathogens and parasites are affecting them. Having that knowledge so we can apply it to other species is really important. And ultimately, we need these better tools. We need a better understanding of the dynamics. Uh, pathogens in many species, they just aren't well described. We're lucky to work uh, on a species with such a, a well-described community of viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Uh, and, and the causes, causes and consequences of pathogens still remains poorly, poorly resolved. And uh, hopefully I've, I've helped illuminate some of these dynamics. I haven't provided you with a ton of empirical data uh, from my own work yet. Uh, I promise to be back and share more of what we actually find in the end. Uh, but I hope that the, the background and, and sort of the storyline has been engaging and, and got you thinking about the way that, that some of these underlying factors could be influencing a lot of different types of data that we're collecting. I mean, I work on movement ecology a lot, but, but there's, there's plenty of other factors and plenty of other ways that, that these interactions and these dynamics can be operating in, in your study systems, regardless of the species that you're working on or the question that you're asking. Diseases uh, is really a ripe opportunity for expanding our knowledge of ecology and evolution.